I wish I could tell you that I am someone who you would enjoy meeting for the first time out of a party. But the truth is I probably am not. And that's because when we meet someone for the first time, we often ask the question, what do you do for a living? And I am a grief therapist. So when I tell people what I do, there are two typical responses that I hear. The first is polite and happy, but also kind of sad at the same time. And they say something to me like, you must be such a special person. The second response I often hear is the negative version of that. And they look a little disgusted and they say something like, that sounds so depressing. I could never do what you do. Now one time several years ago, I got a totally surprising response. And this was at a barbecue in my neighborhood when a dad who I had never met introduced himself to me. And he asked me that question. And I had learned by this time. So I said, Oh, I have a job that's not a very good barbecue topic. <laughs> and, he, and he said, me too. And I said, okay, here goes. I'm a grief therapist. And he said, I study vaginas. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and that was true. He really was a medical researcher who studied chlamydia and vaginas. So even though I love that story because it's funny, that's not what I usually hear. I always hear those other two responses. And, and over the 16 years that I've worked in the field of death and dying, I have had to ask myself, why? Why do people have this response to my work? Why does it make me uncomfortable? And, and I know that when people say, you must be such a special person, that makes me uncomfortable because I know it's not true. I am just a regular person. But I also know that underneath those responses, what they're telling me is that they're scared. People are scared of things like disease and suffering and dying, and grief, and after 16 years, I am also afraid of all of those things. But I realize I have something else that other people don't have, and that is experience and practice. I have a lot of practice showing up with and for people during really sad times of life. So I'm hoping that by sharing a little bit about my work with you today, that together we can face the hard things of life in a different way. So I began my work in the field of death and dying in 2004 when I became a home hospice social worker. And I did that through about midway in 2010. At that time, I transitioned into private practice and I focused on grief. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Um, I focused on grief. However, those six and a half years in home hospice were very formative for me. And um, if you're not familiar with hospice care, it is a little bit of a different approach to medical care. So typically, we think of getting diagnosed with a disease, treatment, and cure. And unfortunately, there are times when treatments can actually hasten our death, and there are also times when we try every treatment and there is no cure. So if your doctor determines that you have a life-limiting illness with six months or less to live, you can elect hospice care, and, and that shifts the focus. So then it, the focus of your medical care is then on symptom management, quality of life, pain control, and as a home hospice social worker, I went into people's homes and I connected them with resources and I provided emotional support and counseling. I estimate in the six and a half years that I did that, I worked with around 1,000 patients in the final months, weeks, or days of their life. Now, one part of my work that I never got used to was going to people's deaths. And in that same period of time, I probably only attended about 25 deaths. I'd like to share about one today. This was my patient, Jim, and his wife, Teresa. He was a 68-year-old man, and he was in the end stages of colon cancer. And I share a little bit about their story because there were a number of moments along the way that I really felt inadequate. I felt insecure, I felt scared, and I just had to show up and try my best and hope that that was enough. So that happened actually the very first day that I met them. I drove out to their home, knocked on their door, and Teresa answered. And I looked at her, and I recognized her. And that had never happened before. And I felt kind of nervous. I felt a little scared. But I said to her, Teresa, you probably don't recognize me, but I recognize you. You were my fifth grade math teacher. And now that I'm thinking about it, you may not want me as your social worker. That might feel like a lack of confidentiality or privacy. And if you would like a different social worker assigned, I can do that. And she looked at me for a long moment, and she said, you know, I don't recognize you, but there's actually something really comforting about the fact that I have known you, and I want you as our social worker. 
So that was my introduction to Teresa, and she invited me inside, and I met Jim, who was having a really good day that day. He was sitting up at the kitchen table, good energy, and he was ready to argue about politics and philosophy, because for him, that was quality of life. And I like to argue about those things, too. So we made a great connection. But he also was someone who declined very quickly. So over the next weeks, he became increasingly confused. He lost his appetite. He became weak, and he became bedbound. And I woke up one morning to two things that were pretty apprehensive for me. The first was there was a foot of snow on the ground that hadn't been there the night before when I had to sleep. And the second thing was a 6 a.m. phone call from my boss, Mary. She was a nurse, and she said, I need you to go to Jim and Teresa's house now. Jim died overnight, and Teresa has been sitting with him for several hours. She did not want any of our workers to go out when it was snowing and when it was dark, but it's morning, and I need you to go now. So I threw on my clothes, and I drove the 20 miles out to their home on the snowy roads, and when I got there, Teresa brought me in and back to the master bedroom where Jim was dead in the hospital bed. And as you can imagine, that is a really sad and also a surreal moment. I wanted so much to be of help to her. I felt enormous pressure inside. I wanted her to feel like I was this rock that she could lean on. I knew there were things I would do. I would call the medical examiner. I would call the funeral home. I would dispose of the medications. But I noticed that Jim had stains around his mouth. And so I knew that this was liquid morphine that when Teresa had been administering that overnight that had dribbled out and stained his mouth. And I found myself, like my, my words were coming out faster than my head was thinking, and I said, would you like me to clean up his body? And she said, yes. But I think my stomach dropped then because I saw that he had a catheter. And a catheter is a tube that runs from the urethra and drains urine into a bag. And, and when our kidneys and our bodies are shutting down, that is a comfort measure. And I knew that part of cleaning up his body would be removing the catheter. So I said to Teresa, hoping she would say no, I said, would you like me to remove his catheter? And she said, yes, I would. And then I was really scared. And I said, I've never done that before, but I can call my nurse manager and I think she can talk me through it. And that's what I did. Mary talked me through it, but during that time, I know that the tension was building inside me. It was building in the room. I was trying so hard. I was pretending to be really a stronger, more sure person than I really was inside. And so when I got done, I literally sighed with relief. I said, I did it. And Teresa started laughing at me. <laughs> and then I started laughing at me, too. And it wasn't a mean laugh. It was just one of those laughs that brought the tension out of the room. And we didn't have to pretend anymore. I didn't have to pretend to be a heroic social worker. And she did not have to pretend to be a stoic widow. We could just be two women connecting during a really sad time. And after that, we cleaned up his body together. It brings to mind something that Dr. Alan Wolfelt says. He is a grief educator and a writer, and he says, you know, we have to reimagine how we are with people in grief. We are not healers, and we are certainly not fixers. We are companions. So if you are someone who would say to me, I can never do what you do, I want to disabuse you of that. That's not true. You are essential to doing what I do. You are a companion. Don't let your fear make you disappear. So how do we make sense of all of this? How do I make sense of all of this? This is the big stuff. This is life and death. And I use stories to make sense of things. One of the themes throughout history and across cultures and stories is the hero's journey. And I really like it for this because, you know, we are all regular people and we are all heroes in our own lives. And the hero's journey, as I see it, or I have found it to be, you know, there's a lot of mysteries, but there are some things that we can count on. And on our hero's journey of life, we will encounter monsters and obstacles, and we are given a boon to take back. So I'd like to share with you sort of the monsters as I see them from my work in Death and Dying. And then I would like to give you a boon to take back, a blessing to your life. So the first monster that I have found is really scary, and it's this. Life is unfair. Bad things and 
including cancer, happen to good and innocent people. And that's really scary. The second monster is this. You will suffer loss. People you love will die. That's more terrifying. But I don't want you to just stare. I have a boon. I have a blessing. And to me, it's everything. I want you to take this back with you. I want you to look around you or to feel the people next to you and know you have a world full of people to connect with, if you choose. And we are all interconnected, whether you choose to be or not. We are all ridiculous and essential companions to one another on this journey. So if it's true that I work in death and dying, then you also work in death and dying. Because this is the business of life, and we are in it together.